So happy to have you all here. You look great. And my name's Jenny Heim, and it's my pleasure to introduce our featured presenter for Doctor Who First Friday, Dr. Edward Gomez. Yay! We knew we had to find just the right person to anchor our Doctor Who First Friday. Somebody who, you know, was a geek like us and as well versed in astrophysics as in Doctor Who. So then add to that someone with both a passion and a gift for engaging the public with science, plus a lifelong resident of Cardiff, Wales. And when we found Dr. Gomez, we knew we had found our doctor. So in addition to lecturing in uh, astronomy and physics at Cardiff University in Wales, Dr. Gomez is the education director for the Los Cumbros Observatory. He has been involved in a lot of citizen science projects, so projects that, that get everyone doing science, because he really believes that everyone can do science. Um, you will hear him a lot on the radio in Wales. He's on a program called Science Cafe, and he also has his own video podcast. So you are in for a real treat tonight. So it's my great pleasure, to, as I said, to introduce Dr. Gomez. So now let's please make him welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be here in, uh, in St. Louis. I'm, I'm really enjoying being here. Um, so, Jenny's given you a little bit of an introduction uh, to me, but I thought I'd share with you some credentials so that you know that I'm bona fide, so that you know that you can sort of believe um, that I'm not only a scientist, but I'm a, a big Doctor Who geek. <laughs> okay, so the science stuff. I'm an astrophysicist, and what's more astrophysical than being on Hawaii on the island of Maui, installing a telescope. That's me there. Um, I'm also an astronomy lecturer, or professor, as you might call them here. Um, and that's me there in our graduation ceremony in all our finery. And there's my beautiful wife um, wearing her finery as well. She's also uh, an astrophysics professor, uh, which means that uh, we quite often talk about astronomy all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, I live in Cardiff. Uh, and that's where Cardiff is. Cardiff's in Wales. We have England just next door, um, but we're not bitter about it at all. <laughs> uh, and as you may know, Cardiff hosts the Rift. And on the Rift is the Torchwood entrance. So this is the Torchwood Fountain here, and there's my wife and her friends standing outside the Torchwood Fountain. I, I, admittedly, when Torchwood is in Doctor Who and Torchwood, uh, you very rarely see the strawberries on the fountain. Um, <laughs> being on the rift, we quite often see a lot of aliens walking around. I was going to show you a picture of some, but uh, I can't remember which one. Uh, <laughs> we quite often see this beautiful spectacle. Uh, this is the TARDIS materializing on the top of Cardiff Castle at Christmas time. Uh, which I think is quite a beautiful sight. We also see this sight. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is Peter Capaldi f filming Doctor Who on the high street. You can see the boom operator, the boom mic there, and you can see some extras doing whatever extras do, wandering about. <laughs> um, and I've flown the TARDIS. Yeah, but I don't think this guy was very happy about it. <laughs> so now we're going to have a message from the fourth doctor just to show you that I really am a bona fide person to talk. Ah, uh, greetings unto you. I am the doctor. I'm speaking to you from the Arcadia Golf Club on Gallifrey, and I wish to introduce a great ally of mine. Yes, a genius. Ah, oh, Edward Gomez. Yes, if ever the relative continuum stabilizer fails or the polarity of your neutron flow needs reversing, well, you really want him in your corner. Rabble rouse for him. Let's have it. Yeah. <laughs> well, if the fourth doctor says, you're a genius, I'm not going to argue with him, am I? <laughs> so, let's 
fire up the Zyton crystals, vent the thermo buffers, and activate the Helmic regulator. We're going to do sp some space travel. So what do we need? We need a spaceship. So if you Google spaceships, what do you get? You get all these things that look like rockets and uh, aerodynamic and things like that. Well, the fantastic thing about Doctor Who is the spaceship isn't. It's not at all aerodynamic. It's a box. But actually, it's wonderful. I absolutely love the TARDIS. The TARDIS is a feature of continuity throughout Doctor Who. And no matter how they might have been tempted to change it, they didn't. You know, occasionally, the Doctor played around with the chameleon circuit. And I remember the sixth Doctor changed the TARDIS into a variety of different things. Um, I think he changed it into a Hammond organ at one point. Uh, and I'm glad it didn't stay that way. Um, but it's so iconic. So how does the Doctor use the TARDIS? Well, the TARDIS, as you know, it doesn't need to be aerodynamic because it's smaller on the outside. <laughs> or rather, as I like to think of it, it's bigger on the inside, as most people would think about it. So we're now going to see a clip of the TARDIS traveling in space in a fantastic episode called The Runaway Bride. I love it when she says, Santa's a robot. <laughs> so the TARDIS clearly can travel in space outside of the time vortex, or the space-time vortex, as it's sometimes called. But it didn't seem to like it, did it? It had all sorts of explosions from the console and stuff. So how does the TARDIS travel through space? Well, I wanted to scare you. There's a nasty equation there. <laughs> this is Einstein's field equations, arguably the most beautiful equations in all of physics. It says equations there, but you can probably only see one. That's because the rest of the equations are folded up inside that one equation. There's actually 16 equations there. And like the TARDIS, that equation is bigger on the inside. So field equation. Do you mean like a field with grass in it? That's actually Colin Baker, the sixth doctor. He looks quite different now, doesn't he? Or do you mean field like a field telephone, like military people have? Um, like military people might talk to other military people on the phone? Like maybe if my clicker works? Like maybe the, ah. Uh, oops, the brigadier. That was an excuse to show the brigadier, sorry. <laughs> OK, um, so anyway. So Einstein's field equations, basically what they are is wibbly-wobbly, spacey wasty timey wimey stuff, OK? That's all you need to know. Scary equation, wibbly-wobbly, spacey wasty timey wimey stuff. OK, so what those equations show is that space and time are linked. You can move through time in a similar way that you can move through space. And time is affected by gravity in a very similar way to spaces. So you form this thing called space-time. Um, which makes things a lot simpler because instead of thinking, right, OK, we're going to move in space and time, well, time behaves differently. Actually, space and time work very similarly in what we call general relativity and also very similarly in special relativity. So mass has a gravitational field, and it warps this quantity called space-time. So you can see here on the left-hand side, you've got the Earth and the Moon, and the Earth has the moon orbiting it because they both have mass. If there was me and a friend in space, and that was the entirety of space, because we both had mass, we'd both be pulled together very gradually because of the gravitational field. We'd both warp space-time just a little bit, and we'd fall into that, um, that dip in space-time. And because of this warping, um, it sounds like there's a chimpanzees going on outside somewhere. <laughs> um, because of this warping of space-time, light that would normally travel in a straight line follows a curved path around space-time. So if I shine my laser pointer on the wall, it follows a straight path from the laser pointer to the wall. But if space was warped, the light would just travel along the warping in space-time. If I put the sun in between me and the wall, well, there probably wouldn't be enough space, but if I did do that, the sun's mass would warp the space-time in between me and the wall, and the light would follow a curved path. 
It wouldn't move around a corner just in an arbitrary sense, but it follows space-time. We see this curvature in space-time all over the universe. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a galaxy cluster. So everything apart from that, 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 and that, those four things are stars, which are in our own galaxy, they're, very, they're relatively close to us. Everything else is a galaxy, itself containing hundreds of billions of stars. So those are little things like our own Milky Way. Some of them are spiral shapes, like this one, and some of them are weird blobby shapes, like all of this. And actually, the weird blobby stuff here, that's a galaxy cluster. Those are galaxies that are quite close together. But you can also see other weird features on it, like this. Everybody see this weird arc, and there's another one here, another one here. It looks like defects in the projector or in the screen, but actually, those are defects in, in space-time. Those are the images of galaxies that are behind this big cluster of galaxies. And this cluster of galaxies is making a type of lens that's warping space-time. So we can see a galaxy which normally we wouldn't be able to see because it's behind this galaxy cluster. We can see it because space-time is being warped and light is following a curved path in this warped space-time. Okay? It's a little bit complicated, but that's basically what part of what that Spacey wacy, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff was showing you before. Warping of space time. Okay, good. But black holes, where do black holes fit into it? Um, <clears throat> I guess probably the Time Lords maybe did invent black holes. Um, by the way, people who are fans of the orange spacesuit, I think they're coming back. I've seen images of, uh, yeah, of Capaldi in an orange spacesuit space looking a bit like a cosmic prisoner. Um, <laughs> um, so black holes, this is a, a, an image from uh, the impossible planet. So there's a, a black hole. It's like a cosmic monster with a straw waiting to slurp ever, ever, up everything that comes into its path, isn't it? Well, no, not really. Black holes don't really work that way. A black hole is just anything that's incredibly dense. So I'm going to show you an equation now. It's not as scary as the other one, but it's an equation that describes something called the Schwarzschild radius, or the Schwarzschild radius, depending on your nationality. And uh, what that's showing you is a relation between the size something has to be to make a black hole and its mass. So here we've got number two, universal gravitational constant, that's a constant, speed of light squared, that's also a constant, and Mass, so the mass of an object. It could be me, it could be the sun, it could be a galaxy. And that's the size of the black hole or, uh, that will be produced from that. So anything that has a radius that is that size or smaller will be a black hole. What that's basically saying is the escape velocity of that is greater than or equal to the speed of light. So that means nothing can escape from a black hole. Not even light. That's why it's black. And at that point, the curvature that I was showing you before of space-time is infinite. So what we've got here is a two-dimensional representation of something that's three-dimensional, fundamentally. All of space is three-dimensional. Four-dimensional, actually, if you include time, but I didn't want to represent the strange time axis on here. So we've got something that's 2D. Now, this portion here is the black hole, and it's got infinite curvature because it's, it's gone straight. Now, this bit here isn't the third spatial dimension. That is something else. This square thing is our universe. This is not our universe. It's uh, elsewhere. It's subspace. It's um, crazy cuckoo land. It's not in our universe. So what a black hole does is it punches a hole through our universe in a very, very dense thing uh, with a very, very dense thing at the center. Now, if that hole that's punched through the universe encounters another bit of our own space, because our space might be folded up in strange ways, very much um, like the TARDIS. The TARDIS is, as we've already seen, um, smaller on the outside. Uh, maybe our space is folded in a higher dimension, and this punching through punches a hole through to somewhere else in our space. If that happens, you get um, a wormhole. There we go, picture of a wormhole. So the space on one side, 
uh, links up, and you've got a shortcut between two areas of space. Fantastic. We've got a shortcut um, going in between two things. If you form, oh, sorry, there's, um, I, I've also put on there the size that the Earth and the Sun would have to be if they were black holes. So you can see that if we made a black hole out of the Sun, it would be uh, about three kilometers in radius, about four miles wide, about two miles in radius. And the Earth, if we made a black hole out of that, it would be about 20 millimeters across. It would be absolutely tiny. It would still be a black hole, though. It wouldn't be a supermassive black hole. It wouldn't be the type of black hole that forms when a star explodes, but it still would be a black hole. It would still have this really, really dense thing in the middle, and it would still be curving space-time. Now, the thing about a black hole is that it has something called an event horizon around it. Once you cross that event horizon, you can't get out. Really sad fact, uh, but you can't. Once you've crossed that, and it might just look like a normal bit of space, and it probably would. It would probably be the difference between me standing here and me standing here. I wouldn't start to feel anything different, but except that I couldn't go backwards, and I'd be inexorably drawn into this black hole at the center. Now, if we had something that made a black hole, say, at the start of the universe. And that's entirely possible, because with the Big Bang, we had a hot, dense area of the whole of space was hot and dense. Then we could have formed eternal, primordial black holes. And these black holes could have formed wormholes to other parts of the universe, which, frankly, was all around it. And as the universe expanded, the wormhole then filled in the space behind space, then we'd have a really shortcut, if we could get into that wormhole, of getting to all parts of space. And maybe that's what the Time Lords did, and that's what the Time Vortex is. If you had some sort of weird wormhole that was behind the scenes of all of space, and the Time Lords had the mouth of it on Gallifrey, and somehow, the TARDIS managed to put a field around it so it could jump in through the walls uh, and then travel in space. And travel in time as well, but travel in space. OK, so we've got a way that we can travel through space, but where do we go? It's got to be alien worlds. Um, the Doctor spends a lot of time on Earth, but we're already on Earth, so we might as well go to alien worlds. The night sky, this is a picture of the Milky Way. I think it's absolutely beautiful. So you can see the Milky Way, the arc of the Milky Way here, this dark band. Here is the, is the center of the Milky Way. But actually, it's very, very hard to find because you have this dark band of cosmic dust. Milky Way is like two fried eggs back to back. It's a spiral galaxy with a bulge in the center, and that's the bulge there. There are uh, maybe 200 to 300 billion stars in our Milky Way. And there are probably as many planets as stars. Now, that's not to say that every star has a planet going around it, because uh, it probably doesn't. But there are stars that have multiple planets going around them. So um, there's loads and loads of planets out there. How do we find these things? OK, we need telescopes. First off, we need telescopes that can look at a patch of sky over and over and see what changes. We're looking for things that are different. That's how we find exoplanets. An exoplanet is a really, really faint thing next to a really, really bright thing. Planets don't shine their own light. So all we've got is the blocking out of light by a planet. That's pretty tough, actually. So we're looking for this change when we're looking at patches of the night sky. So this is the Kepler Space Telescope and the Coro Space Telescope. You may have heard of Kepler as a NASA mission. Really, really successful, found thousands of exoplanets, found loads of exoplanet candidates. And this other telescope, which looks um, uh, rather strange, is um, it's actually eight Nikon lenses that are used for high-speed sports photography uh, on um, high-quality astronomical digital cameras, and that surveys the night sky. So they both survey either the whole sky or patches of the night sky looking for things that change. When they find something, then 
They let all the astronomers know, and we go off and look at them with telescopes like these, much bigger telescopes, m telescopes that are much more available for this sort of thing. This is the, uh, one of the Las Cambras Observatory telescopes, the organization I work for. And this is, we're actually building our own telescopes and we're putting them in a network across the globe. And this is a picture of our global telescope network. We have 12 robotic autonomous telescopes that are used by astronomers all over the world to look for exoplanets, exploding stars, asteroids, comets, you name it, loads and loads of different types of things. But astronomers all over the world use telescopes like our telescope network to follow up exoplanet candidates that are found by these survey missions. And we need really high quality, high precision measurements in order to find them. So, can you see an exoplanet in this picture? There's one there. I'll give you a minute. Okay, I'm gonna make it slightly easier for you. I'm gonna show you this patch of sky four times. One of the pictures has an exoplanet in it, in front of the star, and the other three has the exoplanet behind the star, okay? So that should be fairly easy. There you go. Okay, so, everybody got it? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, right, so, after three, I want you to say A, B, C, or D, which one has the exoplanet, okay? One, two, three. You were right! <laughs> okay, maybe some of you were right. Uh, it's actually that one. So what that tells you is it's really difficult to do it by eye. You're looking for a, a very small change in the brightness of the star. You're looking for a few percent. Actually, stars twinkle all the time. If you've been in the night sky, you can see stars twinkling. So to take away the twinkling and still be able to see this exoplanet needs really high precision telescopes, instruments, and you have to uh, do the analysis with a computer. Your eyes just can't do it at all. Once we found our exoplanets, how do we find out more about them? We've, we can find out what the radius of the exoplanet is because we know how big it is uh, depends on, sorry, we know how big the dip in the brightness of the star is depends on the size of the exoplanet. So we can find out what its size is. You can also look at how the star wobbles back and forth because of the pull of the exoplanet. That gives you the mass of the exoplanet. With the mass and the size, you can work out what the density is, the average density of the planet. So what I've shown you here, on the left is the density of things that we know about on Earth, and on the right is the average density of planets in our solar system. You can see iron metamorphic rock, sedimentary rock, and ice, and Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And you can see that none of those match up with the, uh, the density of things on the left-hand side, which means that all of them are made of combinations of things. The Earth, we know, has a, an iron core, and it has layers of metamorphic sedimentary rock and water. And that's what gives us that average density. And this is exactly what we do with exoplanets. We know their mass, we know their, uh, their radius, their size, and then we model on a computer different combinations of different materials to know what a planet's made of. It's like putting together some nightmarish Lego puzzle um, where you've got to try all different combinations of different colored bricks and different uh, colored layers. Okay, so why do we do it? Well, one of the reasons why we're doing it is we're looking for life. We're looking for the possibility of life. We have this notion of a habitable zone. On Earth, we quite like water. I quite like water, I quite like tea. Tea's quite nice, it's got a lot of water in it. Um, so, uh, and we think, well, other things might like tea, um, <laughs> uh, other creatures might like water, so if we look for water in its liquid phase, you know, we could be onto a winner there. Uh, so we have this concept of a habitable zone. Uh, a habitable zone in any solar system is the region where water exists in a liquid phase, and you can see at the top, you've got our solar system. You can see on, you've, on one edge you've got Venus, it's a bit too hot, too close to the star, but Venus is just on the edge. And Mars, where it's a bit too cold, Mars is on that other edge, and Earth um, is right in the center, conveniently enough. But then other stars have different temperatures, and different brightnesses, and those will affect uh, where the habitable zone exists in those solar systems. So you can see the habitable zone moves, so we've got 
decreasing uh, mass of the star, and that usually results in a decrease in the brightness and the temperature. Uh, so as uh, the mass gets lower, you've got the habitable zone getting closer to the star because the, uh, the temperature and the brightness are going down. So you have this habitable zone. So we're looking for planets that could be habitable. So what do these planets look like? Let's talk through some, I thought it'd be quite fun to look at Doctor Who planets and see if there are any planets that we know about that are like these. So I'll start off with Crop Tor from uh, The Impossible Planet and The Satan Pit. Um, if you type The Satan Pit quite quickly, as I did when I was making this talk, it comes out The Santa Pit. Uh, <laughs> and it's not until maybe uh, you're in St. Louis that you realize that you've written The Santa Pit. So you're very lucky it doesn't say The Santa Pit. Uh, but I think Stephen Moffat's missed a trick there. I think that would be a great Christmas uh, special, but anyway. So Crop Tor, The Bitter Pill, is uh, a planet that's orbiting around a black hole. And this is impossible uh, in the story. I can't remember in the story whether the planet is inside the event horizon, in which case it, it, would be, it wouldn't be impossible, but it'd be uh, a little bit sticky for the inhabitants. But we know about planets orbiting the next best thing to a black hole. So stellar, what we call stellar mass black holes, are formed when a star explodes. Stars that are 30 or 50 times as massive as our sun, they will end their lives in a spectacular cosmic firework. They will explode, blowing themselves to bits, and a portion of them will fall back in on itself, forming this black hole. Now, stars that aren't quite as massive as that, uh, but still more massive than our sun, will do something very similar. They will still explode in a supernova explosion, but they will form what's called a neutron star. Now, a neutron star is a bit of a weird name, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It is a star made of neutrons. See, it wasn't formed of neutrons. The neutrons formed out of the elements. So you've got in a star, you've basically got protons and neutrons. And protons and neutrons in a variety of different arrangements forms your elements. And you know, that's what forms a star. It's mostly hydrogen, which is, um, uh, and helium and other elements. So how do you get neutrons from that? Well, neutrons and protons are actually very, very similar. Um, they've got three quarks, and by flipping the arrangement of those quarks, you can get neutrons. So when the high densities and pressures of um, a supernova explosion happen, you form a neutron star, a very, very dense star. A spoonful of material from a neutron star weighs as much as a mountain does on Earth. So it's incredibly dense. So this solar system, we knew about this star. It's a pulsar, a pulsating neutron star. We knew about it, but it has planets going around it. We found these planets by the, the pulsations of this um, neutron star being altered very, very slightly. That's really weird. This, pla this star exploded, and somehow the planets survived, and we can still see the effect of those planets. I wouldn't have liked to have been on those planets when the thing exploded. That would have been a really bad day. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> it has three planets going around it as well. So maybe not the impossible planets. This is um, a class of planet called a super-Earth. Uh, it's the star in the background, and the dark disk is the planet. A super-Earth, like Earth, but with a cape on. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, uh, it's called super-Earth because it's like Earth, but much more massive. It's a rocky planet, and typically they're a few times to about 10 times the mass of Earth. This one is really interesting because it seems to be watery. So we've looked at the density of it, and it appears to be 25% rock and 75% water. So it's a water world. The interesting thing about it is that it orbits much closer to its star than Mercury orbits our star. So that's a really, really hot planet, but it's also really watery. So maybe the water's not going to last very long in a water phase. Um, so I was thinking of a planet that was like that in Doctor Who, and I came up with Androzani Major. Who knows Andr Androzani Major? The Caves of Androzani. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Androzani Major, the Caves of Androzani is a classic Doctor Who episode. Peter Davidson, um, well, I won't spoil it from you, but 
he has a bad day on that particular occasion. <laughs> I think you can guess what sort of bad day, because um, he has a new face when he wakes up. Um, uh, so, The Caves of Androzani are a great episode. Androzani looks quite deserty there, but originally in the, in the story, it was a water world, and the water uh, just evaporated and it became very arid. So, I thought that um, uh, the super Earth I just showed you was like Androzani Major. Androzani Major also orbits a real star, or what in the story we call um, Sirius. Uh, is actually a real star. It's the brightest star in the night sky. It's actually two stars. It's a very, very bright star and a very dim star called a white dwarf. And a white dwarf is what ha will happen to our sun. It's what happens to all stars that are like our sun, about the same mass of our sun. Now, our sun won't explode in a spectacular supernova explosion. It will become a planetary nebula. It'll slough off its outer layers, leaving behind the very hot, very bright core. And over the rest of the age of the universe, that will not have any thermonuclear fire to produce light. It will just gradually get dimmer and cooler. And that's what's happening to Sirius B. So that's a real star, um, but maybe it has planets going around it, like Androzani Major. Now we're going to see a clip from the episode Midnight. Diamond planet called Midnight, a diamond planet, a planet made of diamonds. How unlikely is that? Well, maybe not so unlikely. Uh, 55 Cancri E, 55, 55th brightest star in the constellation of Cancer has a planet going around it. It was the fourth planet to be discovered going around this star, and that's why it has an E on the end. Um, so that's because of the naming convention of planets. That's not very interesting, really, but it's factual. <laughs> <laughs> so this planet is eight times the mass of the Earth, and because of its density, we think it has an iron core, and it's largely made of carbon and carbon compounds. So when planets are formed, there's a huge amount, there's huge temperatures, huge pressures, and long periods of time. Those are the sort of um, conditions that you need to form diamonds. High temperatures, high pressures, long periods of time, naturally form diamonds. So you could have in this planet, you could have diamonds buried in the crust. Uh, I like to think that this planet has a moon. And this moon maybe causes plate tectonics. And maybe the plate tectonics give way to volcanoes. And maybe those volcanoes shower diamonds over the surface of this planet. I like to think it would do that. I'm not entirely sure that it would. Kepler-16b is a planet that is circumbinary. Circumbinary means orbiting two stars. So it has, um, it has two stars that it orbits, and um, it's a gas giant. So it's not a planet like the others that I've shown you. You, can't, you probably can't walk on the surface. Well, you definitely can't walk on the surface. It probably doesn't even have a solid core. It's a gas giant very much like Saturn. It's about the third of the mass of Jupiter. Um, this was the first planet to be discovered by this uh, transit method, this method of uh, a a planet blocking out the light from the star that was discovered. And it got a lot of press at the time, and a lot of people said, well, we should call this planet Tatooine. <laughs> yeah, some fist punching going on from that there. Oof. Um, no, 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 no. It can't be called Tatooine. It's got to be called Gallifrey. Come on. It's got two suns. It's got to be called Gallifrey. OK. Uh, so, um, this planet, blah, 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 B, sorry, <laughs> Ogle 2005 BLG 390LB, blah, 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 B. Um, <clears throat> this is an icy planet. This planet is discovered by a really strange method. It was discovered by a background star that suddenly went all wibbly. It was lensed by the star that this planet is orbiting. So this planet passed in front of us and a background star, 
and that caused a gravitational lens. It caused a warping of space-time that changed the appearance of the background star. And actually, it changed it in a really weird way that let us know that it had a planet going around it. So that's, this method is called microlensing, and it predominantly finds stars that, uh, planets that are far away from their stars, icy planets, ones that are beyond this thing called the snow line. So we could analyze this over a period of several days, and we found out that uh, it's, it found out what its density was, and think that it's a rocky planet with icy crust and a very thin atmosphere. So I thought, icy planets, snowy planets, Mondas, Mondas, the home of the Cybermen. Some people may say it was Telos. I say it was Mondas. Um, if you haven't seen Tomb of the Cybermen, please watch it. Second Doctor, really, really good. There are some really cheeky moments to camera between him and Janie. So it's really, really good. Do watch it. <clears throat> the Cybermen. I was most frightened of the Cybermen as a kid. Not the Daleks, the Cybermen. Um, here they are. And actually, this was filmed in a castle that was... This is the... Uh, I can't remember the name of the episode. But it was filmed in a castle called Castelkoch, very close to where I live. Now, I was scared of them when I was a kid. If I'd seen an earlier incarnation of a Cyberman, <laughs> I may not have been quite so scared. <laughs> um, that looks frankly ridiculous. Uh, so, Cybermen, they're big on assimilation, big on using humans and uh, life forms uh, to further their cause, build up the Cyberman race. Isn't that a bit familiar of, cyber, of, uh, of Borg? In fact, they look very much like emo Cybermen to me, don't they? I mean, look at them. <coughs> Which is the most emo? <laughs> so, uh, other icy worlds are Ood Sphere, planet of the Ood. Yep. Um, this is a bit alarming because it appears to have a, um, I don't know if you can see that, a planet with rings that is, appears to be orbiting. So that implies that Ood Sphere is maybe a moon, but it's talked about as being a planet. So if there was a planet that was orbiting a star that close, I'd be really worried about the integrity of the, uh, the planet. But there we go. Um, maybe it was um, a prop. No. <laughs> so the Ood Sphere. Does anybody remember the Sensorites? Oh, OK. Oh, right. So one brave soul. Yeah, OK. Two, a few, good. The Sensorites were classic Doctor Who aliens uh, that looked very much like the Ood. They really do. And I think in this episode, um, the Doctor says the Ood sphere is in the same system as Sense Sphere, which is the Sensorites planet. So they may be related. I thought that was a nice bit of continuity for you. OK, oops. So final planet, San Helios, planet of the dead, the special with the bus and the bus that suffered under going through a temporal and spatial vortex, or maybe was just hit by a shipping container on the way to Dubai. Uh, San Helios has three stars, one blue, um, one yellow, and one orange, I think. Um, no, one blue, one white, and one orange. A, a white one could be a white dwarf, like I told you earlier. An orange one could be a star like our sun, and a blue one could be a star like Sirius. But can I find for you a planet that orbits three stars, a circumtrinary planet? Uh, maybe. Uh, Gliese 667 is in the constellation of Scorpius, and it is a trinary star system. It has three stars that are all gravitationally bound and go around each other. However, only one of the stars has planets going around it, 667b. Uh, 667C, because it orbits quite a bit further away. So the two big stars go around each other, and this one goes around the whole lot. And it has its own planets. I hope you'll forgive me. That's close enough, maybe. <laughs> and this has three planets. It actually is a big solar system. It has six planets in it. It has three planets which are in the habitable zone for that star. That star is actually cooler than our sun. Uh, so the planets are, are closer in uh, compared to our solar system. But these three planets, and 667c is the one which is in the best place in the habitable zone of that solar system. But they're much more massive than the Earth. Uh, so, one final planet. Okay, in all of Doctor Who, what planet has the best name? Yes, you're getting it! Yes! Raxicorocophalopatorius. <laughs> okay, Raxicorocophalopatorius has a purple atmosphere. That's the only thing we know about it. And at the moment, I cannot find for you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a planet with a purple atmosphere. But there are loads and loads of planets we know about. 686 
in 2012. This is a beautiful graphic, actually, showing all the different sizes of the exoplanets that were known about. Our, so sorry, planets that were known about. Our solar system is just here. Looks a bit insignificant, really, doesn't it? But we call it home. Um, uh, since that time, the number has swelled. I checked this a few days ago, and it was, um, uh, you know, 1,800 exoplanets we know about. More exoplanets are being discovered all the time. So I very much hope that soon I'll be able to show you, um, or you'll be able to find out about something that could be like Raxacorico phalopatorius. Okay, now the doctor visits loads of alien worlds, but he doesn't only visit alien worlds. We're going to now have a clip from A Good Man Goes to War for the final clip. So Demon's Run. Demon's Run was an asteroid that um, poor old Amy Pond was kept on for the entirety of her maternity. Uh, but very, very soon, the European Space Agency is going to land on something that's like an asteroid. And what's like an asteroid that isn't an asteroid? It's a comet. So this is the comet 67P Trumyarov Gerasimenko, bit of a mouthful, um, 67P is enough. And it looks very much like an asteroid, doesn't it? It looks like a lump of rock, which is really weird because we think about comets as being like dirty snowballs or maybe snowy dirt balls, um, but being, having a lot of snow and ice on them. And this clearly looks like a lot of rock. This is taken from uh, the Rosetta uh, probe, or the Rosetta spacecraft, which f has been flying around taking pictures of this comet. It's revolutionized the way that we think about comets already, but it has a lander on board. And the lander is, in the next, I think, couple of weeks, going to harpoon itself onto the surface of this comet and perform all sorts of chemical experiments on it. The reason that we want to know about comets is comets are most likely responsible for all the, worth, all the water that we have on Earth. They may even brought life to Earth. So if this lander called Philae finds something like bacteria on this comet, that would be totally mind-blowingly, excitingly amazing. Um, if it finds um, more interesting stuff, then I'd be hard to, well, I'd be hard pressed to say what that would be. <laughs> but I think this is a fantastic opportunity to explore what the solar system was like before the planets had formed. Comets are remnants, pristine remnants, of what the solar system was like before there were planets. While the planets were forming, these, these basically, the, um, uh, these were the basic building blocks of all of those things. So we can drill down and analyze all of this, maybe get an idea about where all the planets came from. I think that's quite exciting. So watch out for the Rosetta mission. I just wanted to uh, give you a little taste of some exciting stuff that's yet to come. So before I go, I just want to say to you, um, well, thank you very much. You've been an amazing audience. But also to say to you that I'm a bit of a geek. Actually, I'm not. I'm actually a very large geek. Uh, <laughs> and I think many of you are probably a little bit of a geek or very large geeks as well. And particularly younger members of the audience, I just want to say that people might say to you or might not understand what being a geek is like, but don't worry and don't listen to them. Always embrace your inner geek. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any.